Hello, everybody. Thank you for your joining to this Eden webinar. Uh, this Eden webinar, we talk about uh, new international mobility perspectives and challenges for the rising European campuses. So really uh, welcome to all the participants, uh, welcome to all the attendees and uh, to all the presenters that uh, wanted to share with us their experience in the field. As you can understand, um, uh, the, um, the topic of mobility uh, and the European campuses uh, is uh, really uh, a great challenge for the future, a great idea in order to build better, a better Europe for the future. And uh, we really think together with a lot of people around us, around us that this will be a beautiful tools, a beautiful methodologies to involve students, universities, and cultural world in order to create um, an inclusive world and to create new methodologies for uh, the, the curriculum of the students or their possibility uh, to be more European in the world. So we have uh, here uh, in this uh, uh, webinar um, experts coming from different universities, uh, coming from uh, topic of internationalization and the culture and the academic field. And uh, I am starting uh, this uh, webinar as moderator. My name is Elena Caldirola from University of Pavia, Italy. And uh, at the present, uh, I am the director of the e-learning center of this uh, university. But here with us today are Professor Dorothy Kelly from uh, University of Granada. Professor Ignazio Blanco from University of Granada as well, Antonella Forlino uh, from University of Pavia, and Liliana Moreira from University of Coimbra, Portugal. Um, I would like to uh, introduce Professor, first of all, Professor uh, Dorothy Kelly. Dorothy Kelly is Professor of Translation at the University of Granada, Spain, and uh, is Vice Rector for Internationalization at the same university sim, uh, since 2008. And uh, she, cover, uh, she covered a very important role as Chair of the Executive Board of the Coimbra uh, Group of Universities uh, from uh, 2010 until 2017 and member of Spain's national Bologna expert teams from 2010 to 2013. She has really a great experience in the field of internationalization, in the field of the rising European campuses, uh, because she was directly in touch with the European Commission, with uh, the main um, institution of Europe, uh, thinking about this new way to conceive um, mobility and the creation of curricula of the student. So as a first presenter, I would like to leave her the floor in order to ask her to share with us our, uh, her experience in this field. Please, uh, Dorothy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena, for that introduction and presentation. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to join this panel. It is a very, very great pleasure for me to join the panel with you and to join the panel with colleagues like Antonella from Pavia, Liliana from Coimbra, and of course, Nacho from my own university here in Granada. I think the panel is going to be a very, very good overview of just how important mobility and internationalization in more general terms is for Coimbra Group universities, all the universities represented are members of the Coimbra Group and, and much of their experience in mobility and internationalization stems precisely from belonging to that very first university network which was set up way back in 1985. Unlike my colleagues, I am not going to use uh, a PowerPoint presentation because I would like to use my, my time simply to offer a few reflections in an attempt to frame some of the issues which I am sure my colleagues will then look at in more depth in their presentations. Um, and I would like to spend 
the first part of my presentation looking at this whole idea of new international mobility perspectives and then to move on briefly to the challenges for raising European campuses, European universities, um, initiatives we are all heavily involved in at this time. Mobility has always been a part of, of my personal and professional life and so is an issue very, very dear to my heart. And the European Universities Initiative is, I believe, a very, very exciting and inspiring new opportunity for those of us who believe so strongly in internationalization to move forward, perhaps to move forward a little bit faster than we were managing to move forward under the European higher education area. I think many of us felt that perhaps the process, the European higher education area and the Bologna process had somehow not moved forward as fast and as efficiently as we would have liked it to. And so now we have, I think, a renewed opportunity to, to move forward and improve, improve the quality and improve the depth and breadth of the experience which we can offer to our students. I'd like to start my reflections on mobility saying that, of course, mobility is something which has been discussed a very great deal since the pandemic struck in the month of March. Um, and there has been a great deal of debate and discussion about new forms of mobility, about new ways of looking at mobility. And it almost seems as if this reflection has happened because of the pandemic. But I would like to take a step back and say, of course, as, as we all know, the debate on mobility has been around for quite some time. And in fact, if I would like to take us back to the end of the 1990s, when the movement for internationalization at home, or perhaps with nuances and other names, internationalization of the curriculum, internationalization of the campus, comprehensive internationalization, internationalization for all, um, very, very importantly came uh, on the scene and questioned, questioned a lot of what had been done in international relations up to then because it was so heavily based on physical mobility for what were seen or who were seen as a privileged view. And I think that is an important point to take. So from an inclusion perspective, if we look at the European higher education area, we will remember, of course, that for 2020, we had a target of 20% of our graduates having had a significant international experience during their studies, um, a target which in the whole of the European higher education area has not been met, a target which I have no doubt when the ministers meet in Rome later this month, in Rome or virtually later this month, to see how the European higher education area is moving forward, they will no doubt lament once again um, that we are not moving forward in this target as, as quickly as would, as would have been desirable. And even if we had met that 20% target, it is perhaps important to note that if only 20% of our graduates are having a significant international experience, it means that 80% are not. And 80% is a very large percentage of our graduating students. Um, and this is, in fact, one of the reasons why in the field of internationalization, there has been a movement since the end of the 1990s to point out that while physical mobility, while outgoing physical mobility is a wonderful experience at a level of personal development, academic development, language, cultural development and professional development, it is by no means the only way to internationalize our activity and should not be the only way to internationalize our activity. So in relation to that, perhaps a few general reflections. The first, that there does always seem to be an excessive concentration on outgoing mobility for our 
institutions. Um, and we very often seem to forget about the enormous value of incoming student mobility, both credit mobility, that is temporary mobility, and degree seeking mobility, incoming international students seeking a full degree at our university. Now, why do I believe that incoming mobility is so important for internationalization? And why, I believe, why do I believe it is an important new perspective on mobility? That is because it is um, these incoming international students who will help us to create an international campus, who will help us to create international learning spaces, physical learning spaces in, in the first instance, on our campuses for all, including that 80% of students who will not have an outgoing mobility experience themselves. Just a quick word on that point, and that is, of course, that the value of incoming mobility for internationalization for all is not something that just happens. But like any policy in internationalization, and if we take the definition of David, Egron, Pollack, Howard and Hunter, which many of us use for internationalization, internationalization must be an intentional policy. And therefore, it is up to us as institutions to make intentional use of that incoming mobility in order to internationalize the experience for all of our students. The second reflection here is on the value of staff mobility. And again, here, very often, we have an, I think, probably an over-dependence on student mobility. And we forget that staff mobility has a huge additional value, a huge added value for internationalizing learning and teaching for all. Um, I said, when I say staff mobility here, it, it can be physical, but of course it doesn't have to be physical. The participation of international staff in teaching and learning activities from a distance or with physical presence is, is a huge added value. So another new perspective, which I believe needs to be brought into the debate on, on mobility in general. And then a few words on, on what I know is probably an area which is of great interest to this particular forum. And that is um, what has been termed virtual mobility. Not a term I like myself. Um, I prefer, I much prefer virtual exchange. Um, and just a few words here, because there has been, and I believe there is a risk of assuming that because during the pandemic, we have all been able to attend, to look after, to assist our international students um, online, there has been a tendency to say, well, that's it. You know, now, we, now we know how to do this virtual mobility and we don't really need the physical mobility anymore. I think there, there is um, a huge distance, a huge gap between what we have been doing these months as an emergency response to the pandemic and what is truly online, digitally enhanced, digitally based learning on the one hand, and what is of course true virtual exchange on the other. And again here, there is an issue of course of intentionality in order for virtual exchange to be quality virtual exchange and to have a positive impact on our students' learning and on their internationalization, the methodology has to be intentional and the activities have to be designed intentionally as internationalization. I'm thinking of methodologies such as COIL, which I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with, collaborative online international learning and so on. And just a few words of optimism uh, with regards to the future. If we look at a combination of all of these kinds of mobility and all of these perspectives, maintaining outgoing physical mobility where possible, maintaining an intentional use of incoming mobility to internationalize the experience at our own campuses, involving staff mobility very, very clearly and intentionally in, in our um, strategies. Designing virtual exchange as intentional 
internationalization, then I believe that we can, with a combination of all of these different kinds of mobility, truly begin to offer internationalization for all. I think the new Erasmus program offers us some new opportunities, which we did not have before. Um, in the form of what they have termed for the new programme, blended mobility. Not what we're doing this year, again, as an emergency response to the pandemic, but rather collaboratively designed virtual exchange with a short physical mobility of between five and, and 30 days, together with prior or post uh, virtual exchange. And I think this is a very, very promising move forward a very promising new approach from the Erasmus programme, together with other flexible approaches from the Erasmus programme to short-term mobility, to flexibility in destinations, not limited exclusively to programme countries, and so on and so forth. There are some very, very interesting reflections on, on all of these issues in, in a recent Coimbra Group paper, um, which I would urge you all to read. And I know that my colleague Nacho, when he speaks, will also look at many of these issues from the perspective of ARCUS, the European University Alliance, which I have the privilege to, to coordinate. And let me use that as a brief bridge into the second part of the title of the panel, and that is the challenges in setting up European universities. And just a few very brief words, the only qualitative objective in the whole of the call for European universities has been the 50% of students benefiting from mobility within the alliances. By 2025, now this is clearly, if we think about the 20% target and how we have not reached it yet, this is clearly a huge challenge. And I know that all the alliances both those passed in the first round in 2019 and those approved in the second round in 2020 had been looking very, very carefully, first of all, at what this means. And I think it is, it is um, couched in some very, very interesting terms because it doesn't say 50% of students participating in mobility, but 50% of students benefiting from mobility. And... I think that is a very, very interesting perspective. I think it is much more an internationalization at home perspective than the traditional uh, physical mobility for all approach, which has marked the Erasmus program since the beginning. Um, within the Arcus Alliance, and I know, as I said, Nacho will come back to more details on this, we have set up a Pathfinder group to explore exactly what benefiting from mobility can mean and exactly what mobility can mean in the in 2020 and, and, and in the future. Um, and just a very brief word on the impact of the pandemic, since we're talking about challenges for the setting up of European campuses. Um, and I think it is obvious that the, the timing of the pandemic could not have been worse for this initiative uh, because it came six months into the first round and, and six months before the second round of alliances selected uh, were able to start their work program. So clearly has had a very, very strong impact on the work program and on work programs, which were very often very much based on mobility because the idea itself, as Elena said in her introduction, was that students should be able to move with great freedom. Um, and I'm just a, a final reflection on the challenges and that is that while, of course, we can use technology to move forward in many, many, many activities and many parts of our work program, and you're going to see some examples in this panel, I know some very interesting examples. I think it is also true um, that we are all missing the in-person networking opportunities, which are so essential to developing the knowledge and trust which we need in order to develop these, these alliances. In particular, in the Arcus Alliance, one, one of the big challenges we had is that we have not been able to hold our first annual conference uh, 
we had designed an, an annual conference every year where we could bring together staff, both academic staff, research staff, and administrative staff working on articles together with students and doctoral candidates working in the Alliance activities, bring them all together once a year in order to promote that sense of, of belonging. And that conference was planned for March 2020. Of course, we were unable to hold that conference. And although we have held a plethora of online meetings covering various different aspects of our activity, I think we do all still miss that in-person contact as a basis from which to grow. And that, of course, also has to do with, with mobility and with mobility perspectives. And I think with that, I'll, I'll bring my, my initial reflections to a close, because I know my colleagues will now look at some more specific aspects of what they're doing in, in their universities and in their alliances. And then perhaps we can come back to some of the issues in, in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothy, for this really uh, insightful, of, uh, insight, uh, insightful um, uh, presentation for the future, um, the problems, the challenges. Um, just I would like just in a very, very short uh, moment uh, to uh, highlight some points I particularly um, like in your presentation, some specific concept, inclusion, and uh, um, incoming and outcoming incoming students for uh, incoming students can transform the campus in an international campus, and this is true. The physical presence, the importance of the in-person and physical presence and relations, I strongly feel uh, and share with you the same feelings. But the idea uh, about to think and rethink uh, about a combination and balancing of new tools and methodologies in order to take the best of a lot of tools, about a lot of possibilities that we have around uh, and to achieve the higher level of inclusion for all the students in Europe. Uh, from my side, I want to highlight you in question and answers so three uh, um, uh, questions uh, from uh, uh, a student, from a uh, participant, Almu Hanad. Sorry if I, for maybe I am not pronouncing correctly your name. And can you read maybe the uh, question, uh, Dorothy? Anyway, I can read uh, quick. Yeah. You. Okay. If, if you can read <laughs> and give a, a, an answer um, or, or, or give your opinion, okay, uh, I give you the floor. Sure. Thank, thank you very much, Elena. Yes, very, very briefly, the, the, the first question from um, Al-Muhanat. Again, my apologies for pronunciation also. Um, why don't we gather all our universities under one perfect system to share different views? Well, I, I, I think experience has shown us that one perfect system is very, very hard to achieve. I think that Meetings such as this and alliances such as the small university, European university alliances or larger alliances such as the Coimbra Group Network um, or larger associations such as the EUA, I'm speaking in, in European terms, do a great deal to bring together universities to discuss and to debate ways in which we can move forward. Um, and I think that does happen. However, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not sure we will ever manage to bring all our universities together under one perfect system. I, I very much doubt that that. I very much doubt, in fact, that it is necessarily even desirable because I think that different parts of the world, and you yourself mentioned East Asia, for example, later on, have very, very different higher education cultures. Um, and I don't think we necessarily all want to share one system and one higher education culture. Of course, however, what we do need to do is learn from one another, as you point out in your, in your third question, why do European universities not deal with East Asia universities like Japan and China to learn from their experiences? We do. I think all the universities represented here work with East Asian universities in both Japan and in China. 
I think we learn from them. I think we share experiences with them. Um, in fact, I think that that is one of the things that universities have been doing very, very well over the past decades. International relations have grown and that has allowed us to learn one from another. And I think that's been very, very positive. Um, and then the third question, uh, online learning, the disadvantages that face scholars in producing practical learning. I think there are a whole series and I'm, I'm, Many, many of the participants at this event are much more expert in the field of online learning than, than I am myself. Um, but can I say, I think one of the risks is simply to assume that what we do in, in an in-person context can be done automatically online and that it will work. I think there is, again, a very, very clear need for intentionality in the design, uh, which needs to take on board where the teaching and learning is to take place. I think, Elena, was that? Yes, I, I think. Let my uh, colleagues um, <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dorothy. Thank you for your uh, answers. And uh, I think now is the time to go more in depth in specific uh, project and the European alliances. So we have uh, here in the webinar two examples of uh, European alliances. The first one is a C2U and the University of Pavia takes part in this. And the second one is Arcus, uh, where the University of uh, Granada played the role of coordinator. So I would like to give the floor to Professor Antonella Forlino, who is the um, Prorector for International Affairs at, at the University of Pavia and coordinator for this University of European Alliances, EC2U. Antonella is Associate Professor of Biochemistry in the Department of Molecular Medicine. She has a PhD in Biochemistry and Speciality in Genetics and spent five years of postdoc training in National Institutes of Health in USA. Uh, Antonella was uh, one of the maybe the person who coordinate the effort of the University of Pavia together with the other six universities in order to achieve the result of the European Alliances C2U. So now we are here, Antonella, to know the specificity, the peculiarities of this uh, project in order to know uh, what do you think, what the project uh, thinks and plan about uh, mobility, the meeting of uh, the student and uh, which is the general goals of these uh, alliances of university. So Antonella, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Let me share the screen. Hopefully it will work. Okay. It works. Okay, perfect. So, um, Try to go on. Okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Elena, and uh, uh, thanks to organizer of this webinar. Um, it is a bit scary, actually, uh, talk about uh, Dorothy Kelly because of uh, her long-standing uh, experience uh, um, as a uh, uh, prorector for internationalization and the work with the, the European Commission and with the Coimbra Group. Uh, so I'm pretty new on the field. Uh, as uh, Elena told you, um, I am actually a biochem uh, and I was working uh, on my lab uh, doing my research until last year when I was appointed as a prorector for international affairs. And uh, uh, in within uh, this, my first year uh, of uh, appointment, uh, I was actually um, destroyed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So it has been a challenging year from different point of view. But beside that, uh, the first thing that I was, face I was facing uh, when uh, I got appointment was uh, the application for the uh, European Alliance School. Uh, and uh, actually, I was quite excited because it was a new way to conceive higher education, a new way to conceive uh, uh, mobility in, within uh, higher education. So I got really uh, interested in that. Uh, and uh, we submitted a proposal in February 2000. 2020. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, we got the, uh, we were granted, uh, uh, but uh, of course, it was in the middle of the pandemic. And as Dorothy, Dorothy pointed out, uh, 
we will have our uh, uh, kickoff meeting uh, uh, as a virtual meeting. So that's something that uh, is a challenge. It's a challenge for me, it's a challenge for the university, it's a challenge for the alliance. And we will try uh, to do our best, uh, but we were actually quite lucky in the sense that our alliance per se indeed uh, uh, was facing a, a new concept of uh, mobility in with this, uh, this uh, European campus. So the alliance I will uh, talk about in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is the European campus of city universities that we friendly named EC2U. So what is EC to you briefly, very briefly? Uh, well, it is a, uh, it will be an, a European campus. So a new way to conceive a university, not uh, a national university, but an international university. And uh, it will uh, uh, include seven different uh, uh, universities that are spread out from north to south, from east to west of Europe. The coordinator of our alliance is uh, the University of Poitiers in France. And uh, together with us in Italy, the University of Pavia, this alliance includes the University of Coimbra and Liliana is with us today, the University of Yash in Romania, the University of Vienna in Germany, the University of Salamanca in Spain, and the University of Turku in Finland. And uh, uh, what this alliance uh, is peculiar about is that all these seven universities are indeed uh, uh, university embedded in within uh, a city campus. So uh, all, of, uh, all over the, the um, EC2U will include uh, 600,000 students, uh, over 20,000 uh, of staff member, and uh, over 1 million and 600 citizens. And it will include uh, partners uh, that beside the university are the municipalities, uh, the technological center, the student association, and the national accreditation bodies. And uh, uh, also very important is that uh, our alliance is constituted by Coimbra Group University, and Coimbra Group is supporting uh, the alliance. So what's the story of these seven universities? What, what we share together uh, is over 1,000 uh, uh, paper in peer review journal in the last uh, 10 years or so on some specific uh, uh, field of interest, uh, namely social science and humanities, physics and engineering, health and biology, energy and environmental science. So we start from a common area of interest in order to pursue a new way to uh, share uh, education, research, innovation, and to serve the societies. So that our, was our starting point. And what we aim to uh, obtain with this alliance? First of all, we really like to uh, have a joint governance with shared resources. So we do believe that if we want to have a real European university, then the governance of this new university needs to uh, join uh, all the academic partner. And I will, as I will point it out uh, later on, all the uh, non-academic partner as well. We want to generate uh, a new campus life with a culture and sport event together with academic activity. And we were foresee the um, opening of a specific uh, um, in-person EC2U forum every year, a uh, place where uh, in person we uh, both academia, cities and uh, socioeconomic stakeholder could meet together. Now uh, we were foresee this as an in-person event we now change our view and uh, we know that uh, likely the first EC2 forum will be um, online in a virtual way. And we actually have the tool and, and the ability, as I will point it out uh, later on, to do so. So uh, what the Alliance uh, aim to build uh, um, is the creation of uh, three virtual institute based on three specific sustainable developmental goals that are the good health and well-being, the quality education and the sustainable city and communities. And this three virtual institute has the scope to build up a common activity in terms of education among the partners, research, innovation and service to society. And in within these three virtual 
Institute, what we aim to activate as first is the creation of three specific master degree program, namely lifelong well-being and health aging in the first SDGs, European languages and culture in contact, the second one, and sustainable cities and community in the third one. Now, in order to um, accomplish this uh, quite ambitious program, we needed, to, we needed to foresee a new way to imagine, to consider, to implement mobility. We already, before the COVID-19, and I like that uh, uh, Kelly pointed this out, actually a new way to conceive mobility is not only post-COVID-19. Of course, it has been forced to rush up after the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's something that we were actually already planning before the submission, so last year. So we were planning to um, implement uh, together with physical, also blended mobility, short mobility, virtual mobility. And we were actually considering uh, not only student mobility, but also we were actually aware of the relevance in order to really implement internationalization in a university campus, the staff mobility. And how to create that? How to make this possible? Well, the most difficult things for us was to conceive a way to share data and support mobility in within our uh, um, master degree program and in within our three virtual institute. So uh, what actually uh, we decide to implement uh, in our C2U um, alliance is the creation of a, da a data sharing system, an innovative one called EC2U Connect Center. Now, when it comes to sharing data uh, and to support uh, education and to support mobility, it's not an easy task because one of the traditional ways to imagine the sharing data and support mobility is a uh, uh, student center uh, based. But uh, uh, if we this kind of sharing data and support mobility, then it's something that is uh, manual. And when you do something manually, and we have the longest standing uh, experience on that, not, not myself, but people before me in my university, then uh, all the manual extracting and reinserting student data on case by case basis is really an error prone process. It's a time consuming process and it causes misalignment. The other possibility is to move to an automated data exchange on bilateral basis. But in doing that, uh, there are uh, other drawbacks. In particular, uh, we will have an increase in the amount of cost because we needed to set up and perform maintenance of this automated data exchange. And this is actually complicated a lot, the uh, growing up of the uh, alliance or uh, um, to implement this kind of uh, sharing to other alliances. That can be an interesting point. The other things that uh, it can be done in sharing data and support mobility is uh, to create a centralized uh, database for storing personal data. And this is an option, but if you do that, then you have the problem of uh, uh, privacy. And also you face a um, pro political problem and constraints linked to the single university. So none of these three options seems really um, appealing for our alliance. And so we decided to move on and to implement a new approach for student and staff data sharing by creating a connect center. So how the connect center will actually allow to um, perform data sharing sharing and mobility support. First of all, by defining shared data models, interchange formats and interchange protocols, taking advantage of uh, um, an open data interchange solution, which is standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium. So you, we don't create really nothing. We apply something that already exists. No personal data storing will actually be allowed outside the master system of each university and processing data through a lot local adapter will make possible the exchange of data between the different partners of the alliance. So uh, what we actually aim with this uh, that we call interchange platform to obtain 
and to um, allow the sharing of the data will be uh, to allow for an automatic and efficient data sharing workflow. We will allow a networking scalability because uh, uh, we will uh, be able to set up and maintain linear cost with the increasing of network size. If we, we will facilitate, uh, of course, internationalization because selecting data interchange formula, we, format will be um, used and implemented in within the network. For se and um, second, uh, we also uh, aim to streamline design process. So we will build up, build up on top of something that is standardized uh, in uh, Europe. We will not uh, create nothing really uh, new, but we will apply innovative tools to our sharing data. And we will protect uh, um, the, uh, we will follow the uh, GDPR compliance. And another important thing, so we believe in EC2U uh, as a fundamental for the success of the Alliance and uh, um, support and following up of mobility is the creation uh, or implementation of European Student Card Initiative. We will use and implement this card, not only for students, but for staff. We will make sure that the card system already in place in our university, partner of the uh, project uh, um, will be connected to the EC2U uh, card. And we will also make sure that EC2U card will uh, allow implementation and uploading on open badges. I do believe that open badges are crucial uh, element to uh, support uh, uh, career student and staff activity. So uh, what we foresee as uh, the future for the EC2U um, Alliance uh, uh, later on for long term um, in like where we, where we see ourselves by 2030? Well, first of all, we hope to uh, really uh, create a joint and, per and personalized European diplomas for the trimester. We plan to have an extension of the virtual institute, the three that I mentioned early on, to other sustainable developmental goals. And we are actually already actively uh, working on that. We plan to integrate uh, into university campus life. So we want really academia, cities, uh, stakeholders uh, uh, from industry to work together. And uh, this will happen in uh, a vi vi um, physical ec 2 u forum uh, every year or uh, if uh, uh, possible and taking advantage of our uh, sharing data platform in a digital way when possible. It's very important for us uh, to have, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, and I come back to that, uh, uh, a common government governance that uh, um, join together academia and the communities, but also see involved at a different level all the stakeholder member of this alliance. So uh, just to close my brief presentation of the alliance uh, and uh, uh, brief uh, uh, reflection on mobility in within the alliance, I leave you with uh, our uh, um, email and website. I um, feel free to uh, navigate on it, uh, feel free on uh, uh, contact us for any further question. Uh, what we really uh, believe is that uh, EC2U uh, that has been born, it will born, be born in uh, next month. Well, no, yesterday was the first day, first of November. I do believe that uh, this alliance will uh, uh, move in a, in a new world uh, post pandemia, uh, but it will uh, actually realize something that has been foreseen even before. So mobility for us uh, is uh, definitely uh, relevant in terms of uh, physical. I do believe that physical is essential, but uh, it will embed physical mobility with a new form of mobility, like a short uh, blended uh, summer school will be implemented that I'm sure will uh, implement and help uh, career student and implement the concept of internationalization in a, a, a way that, as Dor Dorothy uh, just uh, uh, mentioned, is not only student going up, uh, out, uh, but uh, student coming in our campus. So thank you for uh, listening to me. And of course, I'm opening to answer questions.
Thank you very much, uh, Antonella, for this very interesting uh, presentation about one of the ideas that was uh, at the top conce conception to, to how to create uh, and design and draw a new alliance between, uh, between European campuses. Um, I particularly appreciate your very smart and intelligent idea how to collect and use data and make it, uh, above all, sustainable in order to avoid a lot of problems, to avoid to create uh, duplicates and go into errors, but to create a, a, a way uh, sustainable and uh, in order to um, use uh, um, already existing data and to share them. This is just a way to maybe to make a, a smart way of uh, internationalization between different universities as a first point. Uh, I just like also your idea to consider from the starting of your project physical blended short and present virtual mobility for students and staff. Another very interesting uh, form to conceive uh, internationalization in a large campus. And uh, very interesting, the idea of a virtual uh, institutes uh, uh, to, to extend also to research purposes, uh, the idea of, of uh, um, European campuses. Maybe uh, there are some questions from uh, Al, Al Muhanad. Okay, questions from, we can start from the last one, question for uh, uh, Professor Antonella Forlino. Do you think putting many procedures will make students face hard work during the COVID-29? Uh, well, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I don't think we really uh, are actually putting uh, uh, many procedures for the student. We're actually trying to simplify uh, their life, uh, meaning that uh, what we are facing now um, is that, uh, uh, of course, international student uh, um, have difficulty, first of all, to come uh, in person in our university. And when they are coming, like they are now in Pavia, they, um, considering the specific situation, they like to come back home because they don't know exactly how um, uh, long uh, they will be able to be back to their country since uh, uh, likely the border will be shortly closed. We hope not, but there is a possibility. So uh, put in place a, a different kind of mobility uh, will be, um, and in this case, I agree with you, it may seem a different procedure, but it's just different kind of mobility. I have the goal to simplify stuff in terms of uh, allowing a student to take advantage of internationalization uh, uh, by different, uh, uh, with different tools uh, like uh, the virtual uh, or uh, uh, blended uh, mobility. And this will actually allow students to get credit for their activity, even if they are not uh, happening in person. So, uh, and also the fact to implement, uh, uh, for example, the um, EC2U uh, uh, card or EC2U student or a uh, student card, Erasmus student card anyhow, will help them to uh, bring with them uh, their own uh, um, experience and move uh, with uh, this uh, credit uh, uh, wherever they want to go. So I actually think that uh, it will, uh, uh, simplify uh, student uh, life and university internationalization. Thank you very much, Antonella. I would leave uh, the other questions at the end of the webinar in order to have uh, a, a more, uh, how can I say, articulate response from uh, all uh, the presenter here in the webinar. So the idea now is to leave the floor to Ignacio Blanco. I would like to uh, have from uh, him uh, another perspective, another idea from another uh, European alliances, uh, European Alliance project, ARCUS. And uh, Ignacio is a senior lecturer in computer science at the Department for Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence at the University of uh, Granada. He has a PhD in computer science and is the director for international strategy at the Vicerectorate for Internationalization of the University of Granada. And uh, my uh, pleasure, very, very pleasant fellow in a lot of European groups, uh, in a Coimbra group, together we were in a learning task force and education innovation working group. And here we are again to discuss about the topic that are in our heart and in our profession, that is internationalization and all kinds of tools, balancing methodologies and methodologies and uh, uh, ideas 
that can uh, foster culture in Europe and include the student uh, overall uh, Europe. So, Nacho, the floor is yours. Please introduce us, Arcus. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Perfectly. And you can see the slides. Absolutely. Super. So, let's go with it. So, first of all, we are going to start uh, talking about, okay, I'm going to introduce you. Uh, what's the perspective of the Arcus European Universities Alliance uh, regarding of the mobility and all uh, the things that support it? First of all, our main idea is that universities alliances have to uh, enable strategies. There is, um, there is a whole amount of knowledge around Europe in all regarding research, uh, teaching and learning, mobility and everything. And now is the time to gather of the knowledge together. So this is a very good uh, initiative of the European Commission in order to have all this uh, information together and to help to each other uh, in the creation of something new, like a new model for uh, creating new universities for the future. From the perspective of Arcus, uh, the university, the European University Alliance is people-centered, is centered uh, in all the people involved, not only the students, but also the academic and administrative and technical staff. So it's for everyone. It's a possibility, a laboratory for institutional learning, so we can learn from each other on the ways of doing and create something greater than all of us. Of course, is mobility and recognition, but not only for the students, but for all the staff that is involved with mobility. Joinness and participation, so it's quite democratic, having the voices of everyone. It's open and, of course, is sustainable. It's something that is requested from all the alliances. We are creating something for the future, or at least a part of the future. Our alliance is integrated by most, more than uh, 300,000 students, more than 24,000 academics, and more than 70,000 technical staff. We are seven, uh, seven long-standing comprehensive research universities. So we have been working together for years in different projects, and we share a common profile as international science uh, institutions uh, with a very, uh, that are, and we have a very large cohesion with our local environments in our medium sized cities. In, from our perspective, we decided to divide our work in six different action lines such as Engage European Citizens, that is coordinated by University of Bergen, one of the members, a student center framework for quality in learning, that is coordinated by Vilnius University, multilingual and multicultural university, coordinated by Leipzig, widening access, inclusion and diversity, coordinated by University of Padova, Entrepreneurial University and Regional Engagement that is coordinated by Lyon, Research Support and Early Stage Researcher Development coordinated by University of Graz, and the Overall Coordination Management and Dissemination that is taking care from uh, University of Granada. We are organizing different activities within each one of the action lines and all of them are involved in mobility, but not only for the students, but also for teachers and administrative staff that can support and help to create this network and the way for moving. We are very used uh, to different uh, kind of mobilities, such as having students go in to another universities in order to attend courses, in a short period or a long period, only for a course, for a semester, for three months, 
or for the whole degree. We are also used to have teachers moving to other universities for a short period, usually one week, in order to give lessons in courses in other universities. This is the things that we used to do up to the moment. We have also students going to other universities to get uh, courses, but I don't know in your case, I'm also a teacher, and it's very difficult to have them integrated in the local groups and so on. So the integration of the people coming or visiting our universities is quite difficult, but it's, it's uh, becoming more and more useful with the times. New modalities for mobility can be can include uh, groups of teachers and students visiting other universities in order to interact with the students and teachers in other universities uh, in the framework of a course or, or just an undergraduate courses. Okay, what's the future? We have been talking only about students, teachers, and so on, but there are also researchers and also administrative staff that can perform their research in other institutions or collaborating with people from other institutions, but also the administrative and technical staff and the managers can enrich local universities by learning things from other ones. So the future is a comprehensive way for mobility, including all the people. Because even a student visiting other universities and interacting with students there and researchers and teachers, they come back to their universities and they integrate the knowledge, even uh, becoming ambassadors of their mobility in their own universities. And now with the technology, we have many more opportunities that can be used. From our perspective, it's quite important to say that all this comprehensive uh, mobility has to be supported. One of the main problem of integrating several universities in the same network is this change of uh, the exchange of information, as Antonella said before. Uh, we are seven big universities with many resources and offering courses and having uh, research facilities and having research groups that can be visited by researchers or PhD students coming from other universities. And this change or the sharing of this information, it's, very, it's a very big deal that has to be worked on. So the possibility of exchanging information, even knowing that the responsible for each piece of information is, is each one of the universities. So uh, it's quite important for us. So we have to decide which information has to be shared and how is going to be shared without having to create anything new that has been worked before. When we go on this, uh, uh, when we go on this issue, I can remember some uh, some question that was made before in the chat, like um, what do you need or which um, which disadvantages can you find in the students when they go uh, like online or the use of uh, technology, it's, there are not disadvantages only for the students, but also for the academic and technical staff and also for the, and also for, for the managers. So here we have a very good opportunity to uh, enhance the mobility or enhance the exchange. I have to recognize that virtual mobility for me is like a, you know, quite contradictory. <laughs> Uh, term right now. So uh, there is a bigger one that is called virtual exchange that it includes all the aspects regarding cultural, multilingual aspects that have to be considered in, all the, in order that the technology can support effectively the, the physical or classical mobility. 
from this perspective, we need to train all the people, the students, the teachers, the administrative staff, the managers and policy makers. And in Arcus, we have a body called Arcus Academy that is responsible for the certification of all the uh, training and teaching and learning activities that are organized by the European Alliance, but also all the activities that can be supported by the, by the Alliance, meaning some institutions are already uh, offering some kind of activities that can be reused. So we are open and open to the uh, reuse of any piece of knowledge that is not working. From this perspective, in the different action lines, our alliance has organized several activities up to the moment, and it's quite it's uh, something that I'm going to come back uh, by the very end. In the action line for research support and early stage research and development, we have offered now the possibility, and it's going to be offered several times during the three years that the European Alliance is going to be running in the uh, piloting phase. We have teams involving PhD students and senior researchers that can join to other teams of the same, in the same way. That is like having very big teams integrated by senior researchers, but also by PhD students working on the same issue. And these teams can go from one university to the other. PhD students and academic staff visiting joint research group in Arcos uh, universities. Like it's people who can perform their uh, work or be enriched by visiting other research groups, not only teams, but individuals. And also the opportunity of having researchers mentoring students in other universities for their PhD studies or their masters. In the action line engage European citizens, we have organized up to the moment the activity rethinking climate change. In this activity that is being developed by the seven universities, 24 students uh, and a number of academic staff uh, have been, well, the students have been selected to participate in order to guarantee a quality environment and a number of academics that are joining locally. These uh, local teams are going to work together in a common proposal and framework in order uh, to have a common experience. So six students will be selected to join a winter school. Six, student, uh, six students per each institution, and they are going to join the other students and also the academic staff in a winter school that will be organized physically if the pandemic allows it. The student center frameworks from quality for quality learning, that it's the action line three, is organizing and supporting all the others because we are talking about mobility and mobility is a part of quality learning. But one of the specific activities that we are organizing is the, the twinning experience like having two groups integrated by six students and one academic or research staff that can visit another Arcos institution for from three to five for three to five days, one week including travel. And they are going to join the students and teachers on the other university. So we expect to have the people traveling back. So having cohesion uh, teams working from the uh, teaching perspective, but also enriching the learning perspective for the students. This training activity is specifically focused on social sciences and STEM, but not only limited to them. But what else? Okay, I was discussing before with uh, Elena, and we have discussed this for years, that many projects and initiatives in virtual mobility, and you can see these quotes, virtual mobility. And now the term virtual exchange 
These projects and initiatives have been happening for years now. What does it mean that those projects and initiatives have created islands of knowledge? This knowledge is uh, spread and separated in, in, uh, in the, the mind of individuals or small groups. And now is the time to gather all them all together and try to create something, uh, something like where you can go to watch what happened there, what you can reuse or what you can create from that. Because some of them can be uh, combined in order, in order to build something new. So it's time to reuse, to reflect, to build the know-how and to spread the word. And something that we used to say in Arcus is that anything can happen. It means that we are not close to the existing modalities for mobility or just the interaction networking in the universities, uh, and meaning also in the members of the European Alliance, but we are open to anything that can happen. So we need to adapt and to use, and of course, to uh, report on that in order to be used again without reinventing what, he, what it has been used before. And of course, this is all that I, was, I, I wanted to share with you. I can give you this contact on our uh, alliance. So, so if you are interested in some extra information, you can contact me or also go to the to the website or our social networks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nacho. And uh, I really uh, attended to your presentation. Uh, so, so incredibly, I am so incredibly happy to know, uh, even if uh, the idea of European campuses, European networks, European alliances, generally speaking, are going in the same direction, of uh, inclusivity, involving students, going on territories of Europe uh, in order to keep together and internationalize using also technologies. There are so different ideas and so different ways to achieve the same goals. This is really fantastic because, for example, your project, Arcus project, this kind of, of idea of action lines is so, so interesting, which each university has the role to keep an action lines. The training, um, the training goal with, for example, Arcus Academy, very interesting, this one. And from the point of view of sustainability, reuse, use, and share in order to circulate ideas, keep the good things and keep them circulating all over the European circuit. Very, very interesting and my congratulations for Arcus project. Um, if you agree, uh, I am inviting participants to uh, write down their questions on a um, question and answer forum. And uh, I would uh, um, uh, I, I would like to to go to question and answer time at the end. And now it is my pleasure to give the floor to Liliana with her presentation about uh, a topic maybe uh, uh, that perfectly fits with this uh, discussion that is the mobility at the COVID uh, era, and to present. Uh, how our university can, uh, how can I say, uh, prepare a plan uh, in order to face uh, this great challenge from the pandemic and uh, methodologies uh, and the tools uh, prepared for students coming at uh, Coimbra University uh, in, in this time of enlarged mobility. So if we can say in this way. So Liliana, uh, the floor is yours, please. Okay, thank you. I have uh, learned a lot with my colleagues from this panel. So thank you for the invitation and thank you for your presentations also. So I'm going to share my presentation right now. I think, are you, are you seeing this, that is everything okay? Are yes. you seeing? Yes, yes, we can see yes. your presentation. Yes, let me. Okay. 
I'm going to talk to you about the, the University of Coimbra, the challenge of mobility in the pandemic era as we are. Well, with, we was created in 1219 with more than seven centuries of history. That means we have passed the Black Death period in medieval times. So are we prepared now? Uh, for this demanding. I think we are, in the old universities, we are. We have to look forward and work, but we are. The University of Coimbra, we was the only Portuguese language university in the world until the early 20th century. That means the elite of the Portuguese speaking countries came to our university to study. We have, we have the UNESCO World Heritage since 2013. There are only, only five universities in the world with this seal, and we are one of them. This is the, the image of the old library that we can see. And But it's possible to read books from this uh, library also. We have more than 300 courses divided in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, Law, Medicine, Science and Technology, Pharmacy, Economics, Psychology and Educational Science, Sports Science and Physical Education, the newest one, with 35 undergraduate courses, more than 100 master courses, almost 70 uh, PhD courses, and uh, I can say we have courses to P post PhD uh, courses right now. Coimbra is a medium sized city. The university is spread all over the city with three campi, one university stadium with more than 23. Uh, sections devoted to sports, different kind of sports, one theater, two museums, 14 student dorms, 18 canteens, 16 libraries, and one botanic garden. Regarding scientific research, we have 38 research centers, more than 400 research projects, and more than 40 thousand publications in Web of Science, and we know that nowadays this is very important to the rankings and so on. More than 100 spin-off enterprises and more than 200 national and international patents in our university. Uh, the numbers of our academic community, more than 20, uh, 25,000 students, uh, 1,700 teachers, uh, almost 1,200 researchers, and more than 1,300 300 technicians. A large number for the academic community in a medium-sized city in the middle of Portugal. And what about international numbers? We have more than 5,000 of foreign students, uh, most of them international students. That means from non-European countries in the undergraduate courses. And the numbers from last academic year, we have 700 of students going abroad and to study in Europe and so on. And we receive more than 1,700 students. So we are an university with multicultural uh, context. And uh, I think uh, we are and we promote the internationalization at home, the internet, a comprehensive model of internationalization. And this is very important to our university. All of them, they came from more than 100 nationalities. A 
everything went well, of course, with all of us uh, till February. And then we have everything changes. We have to create the prevention plan and the actions protocols in Portuguese and English, always, a general guidelines, access and circulation in the uh, University of Coimbra facilities. And we were the first uh, university who decided to lock doors in Portugal and change to a virtual uh, model to distance learning and homeworking for all. And then the things that we have done. Improvise first, of course. Adapt and overcome. We we'll see provides IT equipment, equipment to students who need it. Emotional support line for the university community. We created a UC Active at Home program. It was very interesting to, to do some exercise from home, from Zoom platforms and so on, from to everybody. We created a clinical analysis lab only voted to COVID-19. We produced visors and masks and we donated some, some visors, more than, uh, I think, 300 to Mozambique. And we promote online and cultural activities because we were at home and we needed with the, the need and with the help with the students association uh, for this kind of things. But it was very, very interesting. But change to a, a model or a distance learning model, we change it, but we have the basis of a very high quality uh, service that I'm going to talk about it. Nowadays, we have several research projects about coronavirus related with quality of the air, parental burnout, because it's difficult to work at home with uh, kids all over the place, uh, new citizenships, HEPs and pandemic, an initiative who see thinking about the new normal. What does mean new normal? Prepare the society for a more res resilient, uh, sustainable, and uh, with a new way of thinking society. And we need to think about all of this. And a technique of project, and I only choose one, is uh, 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 they are working about the immune response of our body to coronavirus, one of the things. And changing for the distance learning model. We have this service with a very high quality response, a distance learning service with several courses, as you can see, dedicated also, for instance, exercise and health for people with special needs, or networks and computers, for instance, and also for uh, Portuguese as a foreign language. This is very important, of course, to us with a different kind of different international students. This is a, a very important course for them. Research methods courses also, this is important for the master students and the PhD students to improve their, their knowledge and they, 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 the quality of the, the courses they have. And uh, what we have done here in the International Relations Unit, this is the image of our building. We are in the top uh, of the, the building. What we have done uh, in last, mer last March, March. Monitor incoming and outgoing students via email on a weekly basis. Are you well? Are you not? Are we in Portugal or, or, or you aren't? Uh, we created uh, three new Skype lines every day from nine to till five to answer questions and answer and help students. 
incoming, outgoing, international credit mobility uh, students, teachers, researchers, uh, international students only, refugees, alumni, and general attendance. We contacted embassies and consulates, uh, consulates when the students need help to come and return to Portugal. Also, nowadays, this, this school year is more demanding than ever, but I think we are prepared. We created Do See Teacher, a new platform to give classes in an online and distance learning model. We promote blending mobility as possible, but for me, I, I need to say this. Nothing compares with the physical mobility. But we monitor again the students uh, and we create a lot of online activities, even for the Erasmus days. We created uh, chat rooms, um, Zoom meetings to, dedicated to Erasmus, and we have done a lot of things and then very interesting ones in this new way of communicate uh, online, in uh, online uh, forms that we are also here. What we can say about it? New normal in mobility. We have the same problem in all over the world. If we can see this image, th there are the same image in all over the world the access to the buildings, the temperature, the masks, the isolation rooms. A new image that we never can imagine one year ago. Tests uh, to the coronavirus. So we have the same image, the same rules in all over the world. So why can't we promote again? the mobility. If we can say like this, coronavirus or COVID-19 is all over the world. So we have to be careful with us in our country or in any country we are. We should continue Erasmus in the other mobility programs with new rules, new healthcare, of course, joining the blending mobility when it's not possible, but not being less efficient in the mobilities and so on. And it is the, the message that I would like to, to, to stress is we need to look forward, we need to improve the mobilities, virtual or not, but not going less efficient and the students must go abroad when it is possible, the technicians and the teachers, teachers also, because this is very important for multicultural uh, universities and we live in a global context that we need to, to share, to improve and uh, create alliance uh, as we, we have in the ECTU and so on. So thank you. This is the message. It's a short one, but uh, I think it's uh, the message from the University of Coimbra. We need to look forward and go forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Liliana, for this uh, presentation, who uh, shared with us uh, your ability, I have to say, uh, to, um, to face with this uh, problem of COVID in your university. I was uh, so uh, incredibly, uh, I look, for example, at um, parental burnout. It's fantastic because also from my side, I have two sons studying in different universities and uh, it is very, very interesting to think as a university is in relation not only with students, but also with families. So yes. I think that from your side, not only to provide physical tools like devices, 
uh, if I well remember, but also yes. emotional support. Yes. And it is very, very important because sometimes people feel scared with the technologies, feel scared with the new way too, and the idea to stay uh, close to the student also with emotional part is uh, really, really interesting and also offering, of course, a lot of practical uh, tools, uh, helps, uh, um, solutions and ideas, like, for example, all the ELF system that you provided for your student. So thank you very much uh, indeed for, for your uh, presentation and your uh, ideas. I think that we have only four minutes uh, left for this webinar. And uh, OK, there are uh, two very, very challenging uh, questions. The first one, maybe Dorothy, just two words about too much languages in Europe. And uh, this is a disadvantage. From my side, I think that um, behind um, a language, there is a culture. And when there is a culture, I am happy to share the culture with other people. But maybe, uh, Dorothy, the floor is yours. And the second longer question from Liv uh, van de Brande. And I, I think that each of you can feel free to, to answer. Thank you. OK, shall I just very briefly? I, I don't think there are ever too many languages. I think that linguistic diversity is a huge, huge richness, a huge wealth. It is one of the greatest wealths of the European continent. Um, as Elena said, also, of course, linked to the cultural diversity, which accompanies language diversity. And um, as a linguist, I would never, ever say there are too many languages. No, never. Never. Thank you. Very much. A huge, a huge richness for us all. <laughs> Thank you very much. And for the last uh, uh, question, maybe from Live, uh, there was uh, uh, Live van de Brande. Maybe Nacho uh, wrote an answers to Live. I share your concern, Live. Anyway, you can. Uh, the question is this, the pedagogical models of emergency distance learning during COVID-19 differ significantly from those applied in ideal online learning and teaching, and this is true. Will users, professors and learners, not be disappointed that go back to a traditional face-to-face -face teaching after COVID? Will COVID not have a negative impact on online learning? Your options, please. Feel free to, to, to come with your contribution. You mean mine? <laughs> Maybe, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I was that I think that there is a very big confusion. Uh, even with the, when we are talking about virtual mobility, virtual exchange, and everything, there are many terms that we are not used to use. And it's the same with uh, online teaching and learning, with distance learning, and so on. This is a discussion that we have. Uh, and when we, when I arrived at the Coimbra Group of Universities in 2010 at the e-learning task force, there was some kind of discussion on what we are talking about, because e-learning is only a part of distance learning. There are many different modalities. Most of the universities know, when, because of the rush, you know, we have to adapt in a very short time, and we move from the physical learning to the distance learning, not to the e-learning, because there are two different uh, approaches with different methodologies, different tools. And of course, many of us, we need the training for, for facing this. About going back to the, to the when we have to go back to the face-to-face -face, uh, lessons, I, I think I'm not going to abandon why, what I have learned because I can extend the experience of my students interacting them uh, abroad, the, the, the classroom. I mean, I'm going to keep in touch. Somebody else, is, Anila was asking, what about the problem of uh, making the assessment uh, for online and distant education, even involving virtual exchange or virtual mobility? So it's a real problem. I have decided I'm not going to use exams in the online environments because it's very easy. You cannot have a very clear information of, about what the people have learned there. So it's a lot of work for me as a teacher, but I have to work interactively with them and I can 
apply some kind of evaluation by observation, like interacting, interviewing, uh, making them to make presentations to the other people, be reviewing, and all the things that can be also be done with the, you know, with the technology. So I think nobody is going back to the old yes. modes. <laughs> That's I, I, not going to. Be. Agree with you, Nacho. There will be maybe a rethink and uh, unbundle and rebundle a way to 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 produce education, to produce learning. But uh, we will go uh, straight away just to build something new with new tools, new methodologies, and uh, new ideas. Uh, I think that now we are now, unfortunately, is the time to stop. If uh, Linda and the organizer uh, confirm uh, me, maybe there are some uh, other questions, but I want to stay in my slot because uh, other people are coming uh, after us. So what can I say? A really thank you to all participants. Thank you to our panelists for this very, very insightful presentation. It was really great to spend uh, this afternoon uh, with you. And for my side, I, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Bye-bye and to the next opportunity. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you, Elena. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, colleagues. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.